What's uh, what's on your schedule today? I'm working on the street epistemology course. Uh, did a meeting with uh, some people about that today so far. It's uh, all about what street epistemology is, why to use it, and then how to do it. And it's got like 20 modules we're planning to do. And we've written about 90% of the first seven modules. What got you to do that? Were you just walking down the street one day and you're like, what's etymology? And you start chewing on the... Yeah, and epistemology, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just... I've been very interested in these things ever since. You know, I've been interested in the atheism movement at first, the new atheism movement back in 2011 or so. And then Peter Bogosian's book, a manual for creating atheists came out in 2013, which coined the, the phrase street epistemology, but it has evolved considerably since then. Yeah. And why atheism or new atheism specifically? Were you, uh, you, you liked the way that they were, uh, owning the, uh, Christians or something like that. Yeah. I went to film school in Orlando and the last year I was there, I made a, I attempted to make a movie, a feature film with some friends and um, we shot maybe 80% of it over a summer. And I started editing that movie, which I eventually finished, but over the editing of it, those first year or so, it had a lot of themes and ideas that related to religion that just forced me to consider because I was editing it myself. And um, at that time I was also just, on this new thing called reddit.com and at that time you know the atheism subreddit was a default subreddit um you know which you really improved its thing. quality of argument <laughs> yeah so I, I was exposed to all of that and that made me go down a rabbit hole like seeing a bunch of youtube content around atheism and that's how it started so 2013, a lot has happened since 2013, probably in your life, but also in uh, society at large. And uh, how have you, uh, how is your view on atheism or new atheism developed? Or do you kind of have like a, kind of like a narrative understanding of how that movement uh, morphed and changed and developed over time? Yeah, it definitely has changed and it changed a lot due to James Lindsay, actually. Um, in 2015, I read his new book at the time, Everybody is Wrong About God. And I did like an online book club where I met him online for the first time early 2016. And in summer of 2016, I invited him to give a talk called Ending Atheism to my atheist club in Los Angeles. Um, it's very, that was very interesting. And he convinced me that basically, you know, we should end atheism pretty much like the, the movement around it. Um, and that we shouldn't really think in terms of what religion is trying to do for people in the terms of theism or atheism, the response to theism. There are better ways to make sense of all of that. Yeah. Is there a recording of that? There is, yeah. Is uh, it on your channel? It must be really interesting to have it's there. It's on for... the uh, Atheist United YouTube channel. I think the title is like, there is no God, but God in quotes. And it's, it's funny seeing James Lindsay talk about this stuff. That's not, you know, about all the woke stuff. That was like maybe his first online video uh, that I produced for him. Yeah, it was, it was fun. Good talk. I bet there's some uh, Lindsay completionists out there that would like to have that in their catalog. So you, you've been working with uh, James, and then you also know Peter for quite some time. Yeah, then I met up with Peter maybe 2018 or so. I, a friend of mine wrote a song called The Adult Table. Like a, it's, it's like a, a cheesy kind of rap song that uses a chapter from a manual create of creating it or a concept from it about the adult table, you know, how, Oh, you know, and it, we can get into that, but I flew up to Portland and with my friend and we shot a music video in his garage or attic or somewhere. And, uh, 
you can find that on there on the, online somewhere i won't <laughs> probably won't give you a link it's pretty funny and then yeah since then i've been involved with pete in many ways mm -hmm. and so you you've been creative this whole time but mostly uh through film and uh like what script writing before you you began on the street epistemology project what was your trajectory with regards to creativity yeah i, I finally finished that movie in 2017 that i started back in like 2011 or so that was a big part of my creativity and in the meantime i moved to los angeles and helped out on other friends projects in the meantime and then i started my own youtube channel in 2016 um, and that's been the main source of my creativity so, yeah, since. Did you know what you were getting into when you started up this YouTube channel? Um, no, I was really trying to copy this other street epistemologist, Anthony Magnamosco, at first. Basically, yeah, directly copying what he was doing. But I was doing, he was doing like a stand-up version of street epistemology where he would go out to college campuses or, or a trail at a park and try to interview people, random strangers. And I did that for a while on my channel. I still do that. Uh, I still go out to right now UCLA once a week or so to just chat with random people who want to sit down and practice SE. And that's fun. But, and uh, so, yeah, that's what I've been doing for a while. And yeah, it's still a lot of fun. How does one practice SE? It sounds a little culty. It does. I just have it to does. say that just a little yeah, bit. Yeah. You, uh, yeah, there's different ways to do it. it. It's rare to actually go out with a camera in public somewhere and actually do it physically on the street or, you know, in a park or university. Like the street is not really about f the physical location. It's about really non-academic um, ways of collectively trying to make sense. And uh, you can do it with friends and family. You can kind of, it can be a reactive thing. Someone can say something and then you can kind of go into this Socratic method style of conversation that is more focused on, you know, the person's beliefs and their reasons for it. And now we could know the reasons are good reasons, kind of reasoning about our reasoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I do it in public, I try to let people come up and pick a topic, anything they want to talk about. And I try to keep my views out of it. I explain my goals and give them a heads up about what I'm going to be doing and yeah let them just uh give reasons for their beliefs I, I guide them through questions through that socratic method style so if you leave your beliefs out of it uh, you're not leaving your reasoning out of it and nor your experience and your memory and then your practice and the habit that you've gotten into with this so what are beliefs then that you can just remove from your mind while you're doing this is there like what, what are beliefs yeah i do have certain values and expectations for what constitutes a good reason and a good argument um so i am kind of questioning that from my implicit questionings perspective that's part of it but if they if they ask me what my particular level of confidence is for the claim we're talking about that I try to not make clear unless they ask, but I am implicitly, you know, connecting some of my beliefs and values with when I'm talking to someone. So it is about rationality and logic and reason and all of that, <laughs> that goes into it. But I am also open to being wrong about all of that. Potentially if people have other ways of thinking about things that make sense more broadly you said the term non-academic so there's still reason and logic and argument and evaluation of those things what makes it non-academic like in your mind is that kind of an aesthetic uh, yeah we try to we try to use the language and words of the person we're talking to and we try to keep it casual and we're not introducing jargon from academia about epistemology or sense making or rationality like using bayesian or words like that or or falsifiability or 
we're using these academic concepts, but in like plain language, you know, regular language ways. Hmm. And, um, but have you ever, uh, gotten into a place where you're in the middle of an SE practice and somebody just hauls out and punches you in the nose for asking too many questions? Does it ever get dangerous or heated at least? Um, very rarely. I've never had a physical altercation, <laughs> but it, yeah, but very, very rarely it even comes to like raised voices or anything. Most of the time people are very happy to have had the chat and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's really nice. I guess that that's up to you. Is it just you and and the uh, your interlocutor, uh, or is it you uh, fielding a discussion with two other people? Yeah, there's different ways. I guess as it can be used, it can be used one on one. It can be used just by yourself, you thinking about something, or yeah, with one SE person and, and like and at, at most maybe three other interlocutors. I, you know, to do like the classic SE style. Um, and then multiple, more than three, it gets complicated. You'd have to do, we have this SE survey, which uh, is a little different, but it's still reasoning about our reasoning in, in other ways. So it's more broad, more meta when you get more than three. Hmm. You brought up Socratic method. Is that, that doesn't count as academic? jargon um yeah it is academic jargon i guess but we don't i guess i do also explain that it is a kind of socratic method style i guess i am expecting people to know what that is maybe i should well I, I would just yeah. like to know i just like to clarify what that is because maybe i'm doing it maybe i'm not maybe you're doing it maybe you're not when do i know that i'm doing it when do i know that i'm not doing it what is the socratic method Bogosian explains it in his way in the in the first book with, with like five steps, I think. It's like you wonder about something, a question with someone, and they give you an answer, like a hypothesis for that question. And then you go through the Alinkus, this Q&A thing where you're, you're trying to re rebut with questions, either with like, you know, hypothetical probing questions to reveal potential contradictions in the answer. And then if you find a contradiction, then you go to the next step, which is to revise the hypothesis. And you repeat that from like steps two to f two to four, a couple of times until you have something that sticks and then you act accordingly, the fifth step. Oh, wait, you have to put it into practice? Um, that's just the last or step, yeah. Develop a policy or, or vote accordingly or something like that? Yeah, you just expect it to go with the answer that you come up with. And as over the course of you doing this and interviewing people kind of randomly on a pickup, have you noticed a pattern in what people are concerned about? I know that it's a, what, what's it called? You have a very limited sample because you are on a college campus. So maybe you have kind of a, a sense of what college folk are thinking about and willing to talk about. Do you? Yeah, I do go to a, a local park sometimes and the college campus and those, like I go to West Hollywood Park, the Runyon Canyon Park, and those are all about woo stuff like astrology hmm. and law of attraction. And that's a lot that's happening there. On campus at UCLA, it's a lot of politics, um, a lot of social issues. I also have like a, a little board next to my table with a few potential claims to talk about or broad questions. And I'm trying to focus a little bit on wokeness and all of that right now. Hmm. So maybe that's just a bias in the selection process of people who I'm getting and talking to. Yeah. Are you, is there a law of attraction uh, between you and wokeness going on there? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It is something I really care about. You know, Why? I'm, it's anti-science and un unethical, and which I which I don't like. I could see how it's anti-science. We can go. We can explore that claim. But what do you mean by it's unethical? That seems really interesting. What what makes it unethical? Um. 
the group guilt part of it. Okay. And the anti-liberal values part of it. Classic so, American values. So on that first part, the group guilt would be all white people are racist. And I'm just, this is a claim that you hear black people can't be racist. And so there's this one way assignation of guilt, blame, and then a proposition on acting according to that. And yeah. it, does that bother you? Why does that bother you? Why is that counter ethical to you? Uh, group guilt. Do you understand why people are attracted to that and why you reject that? Yeah. I don't see it as a good way of thinking about justice and getting to where we want to be in terms of a better, a better world. It kind of relates to this other concept of liberal science, which is this manage of, way of managing conflict. Um, that comes from kindly inquisitor jonathan rouse's first book and i think that's you know both wokeness is both anti-liberal and anti-science so it, it's against that main thing from that book and that book is about the morality of that conflict resolution system it is he gives a moral argument for it in the book and i agree with that moral argument and wokeness is just against <laughs> liberalism and science and liberal science so have you spoken with someone who ascribes to this woke ideology and been able to question the assumptions that underline the claims because it seems like there's not a lot of questioning or they do a lot at least the institutions do a lot to preclude questionings of the claims so have you been able to work on that individually and drill down into that and see how it's operating? Yeah, I still have not had the conversation I want to have with someone who is as woke as I'd like to have someone be when I talk to them. Like, I really want to test out street epistemology if it can be used with the woke. Like, I know it can. it's great for virtually any other kind of ideology or belief, but the woke ideology it's super hard i have i did talk with someone i think two weeks ago we talked about in you know, like revolution or reform and she was very woke she wanted revolution <laughs> she was like all she was mentioning stuff like the pedagogy of the oppressed and a bunch of other um books like that like she went she mentioned she read the new jim crow in a community college and that inspired her to go to ucla and learn more about this stuff and we got pretty deep um but not as deep as i wanted to i, I still want to it still requires more more testing anthony magna bosco talked with someone a couple of years ago and then i did a reaction video with james Lindsay. Uh, did you see that one that that first reaction video the very recent one or is this a prior the prior one that did okay. that yeah i did a reaction video with james about those two conversations anthony talked with someone who's very woke and that got pretty deep so i think that's the best example so far i have an nasty conversation with someone who's woke what causes this is a more general question. What causes something to become more deep within uh, street epistemology? How do you know you're getting deep? Yeah, there's like the belief in the epistemology level and then the feelings level and then the identity and psychosocial motivations level. It can go that deep. And once you hit identity and those psychosocial motivations, that's pretty deep. You talk about stuff like meaning and morality and all of that and that's that's all very deep it sounds like when you use the term identity you don't mean in the intersectional way no like your okay. personal individual individual self and identity like how it fits in with your community and social it's like the sociality uh part of it that's another 
framing that I get from everybody's wrong about God, James Lindsay's book. It's about these three main things, the you know, main categories of psychosocial motivations, two psychological, one social. This psychological one is control. Two is um, sense making or ways of making sense of the world. And the third is the social one that just the general sociality um, category of of kind of a psychological or social motivation. I think that's what he claims God is doing for people, helping people meet these needs. Okay. Or God or God or mm -hmm. God. The concept of God in theism. Well, I was speaking with James Lindsay just this past weekend and, uh, he's he's and he's a good friend of mine at this point uh and mm -hmm. uh, i'm watching him develop over time or his arguments and uh his investigations just lead him from one thing to the next and he began to use theology as a term and i had not heard him use that and he brought up a writer i have all my notes here but i'm not gonna uh slow down or Talk. Neumann or something? Is it Neumann? He was talking about, the, this author was talking about the university and how there's a theological component that if the university doesn't have a theological component, which would organize epistemology, ontology, axiology, which is about values and sociology, then that will eventually be filled by something else. Uh, and usually probably by people without the tools to do that work, to build this theology. So that kind of runs into a you know, street level critique of the woke as being a new religion and coming from a new atheist background and then going through a number of different changes, I suppose. What is the quality of a theology or a system of belief that is necessary for social cohesion and for and, and to replace or to mitigate the anti-liberal, anti-science bent of this woke stuff? What, just what is your conception of a need for theology or a need for some sort of God consciousness for us to get out of this quagmire? That's the question of our age at this point how do we get this what some people call a religion that's not a religion but it, it is that robust science of meaning that james says like what a theology that connection of epistemology ontology and axiology at this point the best i've got is that argument of the naturalist nuke from king crocodile's video um like that's a good starting point for how potentially epistemology axiology and ontology are all related it's like he uses he grounds science as a natural um value category it's like it's a it's a category that a value that nature produced not society that's the thing that is very interesting to me and if we had that we could ground a lot of stuff on that and then build on that potentially but that's that's over my pay grade i have no idea <laughs> wait you're getting paid for this <laughs> <laughs> don't answer that uh natural value though doesn't that a uh, run against this uh and this might be uh the problem i have with people using fallacies uh is that they're kind of basically they, there's a fallacy fallacy where people just say oh that's a what aboutism or that's a sea lioning or that's a slippery slope or that's a natural fallacy we just say oh we just don't do that they become axioms rather than uh bad reasoning so it might be worth kind of impacting uh, this would probably be on my pay grade too the natural fallacy and how you would get from derive an ought from an is and how science would be that derivation process perhaps yeah in the video he says he's not doing that um, they always say i'm that. not sure i'm not sure it's like not we're not claiming the values are potentially good it's just we're just saying they're natural value and natural values and what he's talking about is this way of developing a model that is scientific 
science it is science is really an evolved cognitive process that all life uses um, to pragmatically exist in reality and there's like we can get into that but that's what that's about and he does he does say it's like not exactly deriving a not from it is but you'd have to talk with him to more mm-hmm. more about that potentially yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've spoken with Brett Weinstein quite a bit. He's an evolutionary biologist, as I'm sure you are aware. And uh, I trying to I, I did a lot of interviews with him around evolutionary biology and trying to grapple with that understanding of the world just as an assumption of something more coming from something less or life coming from that which isn't life just by some sort of random process and you kind of get a sense after listening to it for a while i've gotten a sense that basically evolutionary theory is describing an editing process within the realm of existing in time and being mortal uh, or existing within time meaning that there's entropy happening and and that's kind of a value set everything that survives entropy is uh, goes through an evolutionary process, especially as the world's changing and then uh, adaptation happens and then also sexual selection happens on top of that, um, which is kind of a prediction tool, sexual selection being a tr- prediction tool of one of the mates or both of the mates deciding this is a bet that I'm going to make because it's probably going to pay out. And they, you said that science is a cognitive or a high, high cognitive process, but it's basically blind until you get some sort of conscious being or pseudo conscious being. Yeah, an evolved cognitive process, and even slime molds do it. That's another part of the video that King Crocodile showed. It's like they can create models of the world and act in it and solve problems in a very proto way, but. Okay. Yeah. So the science being the creation of a model of the world and then uh, conforming one's behavior to that model of the world to exploit it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's differences in quality of these models. And he gives four big, the big four operational criteria, he says, is like how you judge the quality of this module, model for criteria. Yeah. The first one is applicability its ability to pre- um, predict uh, stuff in the world accurately and precisely the second category is efficiency um, how well the model works it by itself individually and how well it works with other models and it's like parsimony and consilience uh, the next third is accountability how well it it works with new evidence coming in. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be too flexible or too rigid. It wants to be just right. Um, like, yeah, we'll get into that. And then the internal consistency of the model, the rational coherence. Like, it, it can't be contradictory with itself. Hmm. All, all of those big four things are how you judge the quality of a scientific model, he says. And slime molds do this. And so... And like all of life does this, hmm. and it's very interesting. I would say that wokeness, insofar as it's a ideology that has been created through a process of selection in the academy and within the Western world, and then within uh, your post enlightenment thinkers, if you trace back the where it came from, it's still an evolved thing, and the way that it's spreading probably is operating scientifically but the field of reality that it's operating in is not the individual level not the reality level but the institutional level the institution environment is exploiting and if we look at it that way we can see it as kind of a kind of impersonal but also at the same time personal thing that's operating yeah there's just like this parasite leeching on to the core thing of science like scientific institutions are not itself science mm-hmm. which which may be in conflict with what jonathan rouse has in his new book like king crocodile says there is a core of science and that's the development and testing of these models and then there's an institution wrapped around that and all of that um that, that's related to that so yeah 
And there's a feedback loop there because you can't really have science being tested adequately without some sort of infrastructure to test it. But insofar far as science is able to provide some sort of success, more institution grows around science. Over yeah. time. You can get higher quality models with better infrastructure and administration, but we can still, we can still do science ourselves individually and collectively outside of academia. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking if you look at the kind of the forerunners of the modern day enlightenment, a lot of those men were basically uh, independently wealthy uh, in one way or another. There wasn't a lot or the extent of the institution institutional infrastructure for science wasn't there. But once science, the industrial revolution, the byproducts of science came into play and then all the wars and just the changes in society, then you have this institution if we just look at the united states of america just this sprawling kind of decentralized institution with pockets of centralization within i guess departments or some form of uh, i i guess back in the day before they were compromised those those journals were kind of centralization of the knowledge that was kind of decentralized in all these different individual universities and if we look at how wokeness advanced through the institution, you can see that it started outside of science itself. Or what do you think about that? Like, yeah, like scientific journals is one place our knowledge can live and it can, that can be corrupted through idea laundering, as Brett says, mm -hmm. which I think has happened, um, which is a tragedy. It's killing the leg legitimacy of the university system at this point allowing all that idea laundering to happen like we want to be able to trust them but yeah we can have knowledge live in books outside of peer review in just the popular culture potentially where people just it's memes it's like at the, the meme level it's just out there but at some point it has to be organized in order to create an effect. And if wokeness itself is glomming onto the organizational structure, and I think eventually it'll meet up to, with reality and hopefully humans, the human reality will stop it before it crashes into reality itself. Um, but it, it's glomming onto the infrastructure. And like you're saying with idea laundering, I see this in a lot of different areas, not just within journals. And I guess we should define idea laundering. It's the product of using um, the prior, uh, the prior, the, the authority that was accumulated by the institution and then populating it by people that have the titles, uh, you know, of doctor or of expert, th then start to promote certain ideas over time and then just share those ideas over time without ever actually having to test those ideas. Like there's this breakdown of actually testing the ideas. There's a breakdown in the accountability aspect of uh, knowledge creation. Yeah, like the usual way you, you, you do peer review is what Wokel said in one of your videos before. It's like you set aside your biases and then make objective judgments. Uh, like you make objective tests, have these high quality models and test them with as much with as much bias mitigated as possible that gives you scientific credibility but this you know the deal laundering is like they're kind of separate journals all incestuously together and they just make assertions and cite each other and it's just assertion built on assertion and mm -hmm. nothing objective coming into it at all that people could check in the mm -hmm. real world you know mm -hmm. Yeah, so ultimately the uh, the net byproduct of all of those ideas that haven't been checked in the real world will have to be checked at some point. So either we can speed it along and go nuclear, like, uh, I don't know if King Cockadex saying we should go nuclear. James has said we go nuclear. Peter Bogosian said we, can, we should just go nuclear. What do you think about that? I don't know. It would be sad if everything went nuclear in that way, which is just the institution is just falling. And I don't know how that would happen. Like you would have 
95 percent of them potentially fall and like the the few with the, the big endowments survive but parallel institutions that's going to take a long time mm. what are we going to do in the meantime i don't know this is hard yeah. well if if what they're producing is mostly crap then what's isn't there like a net benefit for them not being around and by that i mean a lot of the humanities departments just these reams and reams and reams of papers on critical theory and revolution and all that stuff there's only so many gender study papers that need to be produced there are only so many and there are only so many bodies that can be uh, medically altered uh, to conform to these gender beliefs so we don't need them replicated in every city every state right true true but if they're yeah. going to take but i guess the counterbalance is that if they're going to take down science with them if they're going to take down all their research institutes and all the research happening with them which is probably likely what will happen yeah we need that stuff that's we need that we need that for sure and uh so we need to like audit these universities that's one Hmm. project that Peter Bogosian is going to be doing next spring that I'm going to be helping him with, um, like a university reverse Q&A tour. Have you seen that, his video on that yet? No, not yet. Yeah, he's going to be just next spring going on a tour of like 10 to 15 universities and inviting people to, like students to speak, and he'll be in the audience and ask, ask them questions to try to help them think about stuff and just get a sense of where they are in terms of how much social justice is in their classes like is it causing a problem and just letting them speak and hearing all what what's happening in, in the universities hmm. yeah from the ground up from the students rather than the admin or the faculty yeah who mm. have a vested interest uh of varying sorts to keep certain things under wraps i'm sure mm. not least of all liability if the lawyers are are there and they will be there because this stuff will probably be recorded if you're involved oh it'll be recorded and posted <laughs> very shortly on youtube all of it we're going to try to record a, a lot of stuff it's going to be fun mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're doing all this thinking and you're doing all this working with these high profile individuals what do you do you have like a a repository of of your understanding outside of the interview do you have a like a some sort of writing that you're doing or how do you concretize your understanding of where you are in the world as you're doing all this yeah, i do have kind of second brain type system i'm very also a productivity nerd i have like an evernote where i take all this stuff that I find and stick it in there. Although I need to review it more. I do have this other way of categorizing arguments in this website, kialo.com. And I can kind of organize the arguments and claims and claims for claims, reasons for reasons within <laughs> that, that site. That's one way I'm, that's helping me for sure. And uh, I, I did a video on with Hill and Pluck Rose two years ago i think and we talked about the broad question what's the best way to help make the world a better place the or the best ideas and values to do it and we had a bunch of answers like liberalism and critical social justice conservatism yeah, all of those answers were there and that's like my map of 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 that and there's it's huge by now it's it's really big is it like a do you have a a model or is it 3d printed somewhere you sell it for christmas uh swag uh no no it's just my own thing i i have i'm always adding stuff to it is there a are you ever tempted to have a belief system uh say uh, i'm a classical liberal i am a post-christian i'm a neophyte of l ron hubbard or anything like that mm. It's hard I, I do think i think of myself as a liberal as a humanist liberal humanist i guess and you know that's as far as i go at this point um i do want to keep my identity small there's a lot of bias that comes in if you 
have too big of an identity or adding glomming on too much to it potentially hmm. it's hard to have it be questioned if it's part of your identity hmm. stuff like that that, that's a uh, a difficult balance to explain to people who rely on labels to categorize people. You know, I had a live stream with Adam Friended, and he wanted me to say that I was a centrist or not, <laughs> and and I couldn't, I can't, I can't assign myself a label without feeling a loss of flexibility. But I know that that camp comes at a price of not necessarily confidence, but maybe something like that. It's it's hard to it's hard to to do anything with any amount of leverage if you don't have something to stand on, and so I have to choose my battles carefully or how I engage carefully because I don't want to be forced into a position where I have to cement. Something like a label, uh, but then I know that that makes me sound pretty fishy, um, and and uh, kind of like a sneaky fucker uh, as a technical term. Mm -hmm. um, so there's kind of like that cost benefit uh, analysis on that level. Mm -hmm. There's disadvantages and advantages to having a public identity associated with stuff like that. Like it allows you to fit in better, easier. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like. We're part of this like tribe of non-tribes, I guess. It's, it's it's the skeptical part of tribes, tribe. Huh? Yeah. Is it, does that? Um, I guess that makes uh, this skeptical tribe is inherently uh, weak. It's like herding cats in a way, and I see that the role that we have is kind of a servant to other tribes or a servant to individuals within tribes where we are there's probably some sort of biological metaphor about some sort of thing that transports nutrients between other things right there's some sort of uh we, we can affect a causeway the centrist is that which is run over it stands in the middle of the road so long that it becomes the road itself right mm -hmm. we're being run over is part of our identity maybe or function rather than identity yeah, there's this one white paper that I love that came about a few years ago called The Mimetic Tribes and the Culture War 2.0. Yeah, yeah. And Street Epistemology Tribe is one of the mimetic tribes. And they have one concept of called like the mimetic mediator is one thing someone could do. And that's something I've been thinking about with with SE. I think it that would be a perfect fit for SE. Does that work on the level of the uh the meme like the meme meme like the the crude meme yeah like yeah the, the pepe you can you can get pepe uh to speak to a hillary uh clinton supporter it's, potentially that would be great i'd love to see that yeah khaki stan uh and, and bernie bros kind of start to get along a little bit but the problem one of the diagnostic problems with wokeness or what we call wokeness is its resilience or its ad avoidance of mediation of being mediated yeah of conversation in general mm -hmm. that's the problem it's like they they all have interaction but it's mainly hmm. combative <laughs> and you know you're you're just insulted and said a bad you're said you're a bad name or something that's mm -hmm. how it usually goes so but there are people on the border of woke that yeah. are more able to be talking talk to do you think that it's actually not as big of a problem or it, it's highly overrepresented because of how it represents itself as purely combative maybe that's hiding just how little credence it actually has yeah potentially yeah mm -hmm. so potentially you, you don't we'd have to figure that out we'd have to establish a test yeah maybe yeah mm -hmm. hard to say yeah i'm but i'm just going out there to the university and seeing who will talk to me hmm. within within it if they're in deep or on the edge either one i'm interested and 
have you seen people move from on the edge or outside of it into it have you seen the transit into becoming woke i guess you hinted at that with uh that one woman you spoke to about who read jim crow or the new jim crow and uh do you understand what ideas it there are or it it holds up that allow people to become identified with it maybe there's there's one distinction that james says it's like structural determinism if you accept that then you're down the road of woke but if you reject that then you're not which is the systemic nature of these ideologies they claim like if you accept we have we are socialized into political positions due to forces outside of our control and that implies we should do certain things in the world that's a interesting hmm. criteria the more you buy into that hmm. the harder it is to probably have a conversation uh, to to mix in jonathan height there might be a not just so much a moral predilection or a psychological predilection but an intellectual predilection to perceive oneself as the product more rather than less of social determinants and then that would be why you would end up saying that you start believing in that there's might be some sort of circumstance prior to that belief that gets people to believe that and academics might it, there might be some sort of midwittery going on where either resentment uh or they, they're not getting enough or they were promised one thing and they see that they're kind of, kind of second-rate citizens and they think more highly of themselves uh also you see kind of in feminism and other uh not feminism as a whole but within the activist side of it and other groups that glom on to a victimhood mentality there's certain circumstances that make them feel like a victim and then that becomes their identity and then and then once you have victim status then you have to believe in social determinism because it, it, i don't even think it's social determinism so much as the locus of control is outside of you when it, once once that is there, then you're probably going to believe in some sort of determinism. You have to. Mm -hmm. So it's more about where your determinism is located. And it's more than mere social determinism, but like the structural determinism, which means social constructivism or critical constructivism is the woke core ideology. Like the, the critical constructivism, it's... It's that fusion of the critical theory and the postmodernism together. That thing, mm. if you think that stuff determines who people are and how they act and how they think, that's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Like, how do we get people who think that way or have that model of, of the world to shift to? A higher quality model why is that a disaster for the reason we discussed before is the it creates um us versus them type thinking and it becomes a, pot, a negative sum game and that will mm. lead to violence eventually mm. the uh i mean where i started at the evergreen state college and i'm back into it now i kind of finished the documentary that i did on it which took me a long time and then i just kind of said i'm done now but then i had one more thing to do and now i'm doing that thing and so i'm going through all the transcripts and trying to organize it in a way that can convey the belief and then the different levels of uh axiomatic or the different ways that that belief manifests in the different characters depending on basically their status in the hierarchy uh the the president of the college if he be believes in this stuff he has to prostrate himself and then the lowest people on the college have to force him to prostrate himself so they can't even allow him pr to prostrate himself every time he does they have to like actually like kick him when he's down because of the way that this entire critical project works is that the deconstruction of hierarchies is in and of 
in itself the right of passage for this thing to operate. And so you can't allow the person on the top to humiliate themselves without also humiliating them even further. There's this complete destruction of everything that goes along. And, and that, because as I was going through all the footage of that incident, it just, it's, there's so much contradiction constantly going on that it's really difficult to understand it because it's constantly contradicting itself. So you have to figure out how, how is there like a precursor, some sort of pre-contradictory understanding that they have that allows them to get away with all these contradictions, you know, because they're just dangling over the abyss and it's just it's so it's just a fascinating thing and i'm i'm taking all that stuff and i'm transcribing it into music which is a completely different form so trying to use music as a mode of communicating this stuff is eventually going to lead me into a cul-de-sac because i would have to actually like become counter harmonic and disharmonic and cacophonous uh in to really convey the, the, the tone and the music of this it has to contradict on every level so oh, as wow. we go through as we go through that i'm gonna have to just be listening to to that wow yeah i don't envy that job going <laughs> man that stuff is so stressful to watch yeah your documentary mike nina's documentary and hopefully we'll get a lot more next spring <sighs> Oh wait, like, you're you're hoping that that some uh, the glass house will get a few cracks. It'd be nice to have guess. some drama. <laughs> it'd be nice to have something. Yeah, you know, it's just if your social status and prestige are tied up in victimhood, you'll get there by any means necessary, contradictory or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you? Yeah. Was there a moment in your intellectual development where you were imbalanced and there's two ways that this could go i'm thinking but i want you to answer the question but i was just thinking you're aware of this victim status were you ever uh tempted to think of yourself as a victim or on the other hand being hyper rational was that not was there not like a period in time where you just deconstructed everything in your head and got meta 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 and then learned how to control that yeah the new atheism as a movement went woke in 2011 right when i entered it oh. and i and i picked up a lot of that you know ethos of victimhood and oppressor and yeah i guess some at some point i felt pretty guilty for being who i was like my also my class status as well and all of that but i since hmm. then i've i've gotten past that not sure how it worked or how it happened not sure was was there like a religious community that you were in prior to uh, new atheism did you have a sense of like within christianity guilt is constellated in a entire equation in new atheism did you is that when you first discovered that guilt existed and no, I was I grew up Southern Baptist. Um okay. so there was some guilt there uh, yeah. growing up nominally and then it waned over time through from high school into college. Yeah. By college I was very apathetic about religion in general. Okay. And then within new new atheism and then weighted by that guilt, was that an anti apathy uh awakening kind of thing where you had meaning and motivation? Yeah, it's just that age range of 18 to 22. Yeah. People start trying to figure out who they are and what they should do. And that was just me. You know, I, I found atheism as a, as a potential important set of problems to help solve. And I think that they had some legitimate problems that they wanted to solve. And I think they virtually solved them at this point. So, like just the Christian supremacy type problem in the culture, I think that's gone now. I think we're fine. I think it's not a big deal to be an atheist in society at this point. So, well, you're either 
<laughs> you either you're either a racist or an anti-racist. Ah, uh, yeah, that's and that's so the main the... thing now. So who cares what I, <laughs> about atheism anymore? You know? I don't think I I really don't know, and I I think it's uh, cognitive capacity and also probably some sort of psychological spin. I don't think that society as a whole can be anti-religious or non-religious. There is only certain forms of religion that allow for people who don't need it to interact with people who do and to allow the people who need it to accept people who don't and vice versa. I mean, that's the kind of the religion non-religion thing has to take into account that the, just on a society level there's just people that need it and yeah. want it too mm -hmm. and people who don't yeah I, it kind of relates to james's theology thing like we we all seek meaning and his like science of meaning thing which he defines theology as like meaning is important to all humans to varying degrees and religion is one way of meeting that in general but there's there are other ways and some some need a lot of it and use religion to do it but i'd love to have another way that has i can get to meaning in a kind of meaning that relates all of these things of the epistemology ontology and axiology something really robust that yeah. would be great yeah do you do you have a do you have a clue like what how what kind of meaning you like and and how you like it yeah stoicism is good mm -hmm. i like that philosophy um and just uh just the general you know being connected to a community that cares about issues that you care about and having shared projects in that way and just having you know, quality relationships, hmm. um, friendships, and all the other relationships, stuff like that. Love, you know, loving relationship, trying to get there for me, but eventually. But right now, friendships, shared projects, shared, you know, that type of thing. That would do it for me. Is there a subsidiary way that you interact with people besides talking? Seems like you're a talker. I'm a talker too. That's how I exchange meaning with people. Is there another non-talking activity? Um, I do poker with oh with with, with uh, friends, but that's kind of just an excuse to talk, I guess. But I do. I still like the game and, <laughs> and the the di di dynamics that happen from that. Um, besides that, I'm not really into sports or anything are you good at poker you think not really no i'm okay i don't understand the game i can't keep value stable for that long every time oh really yeah mm -hmm. how did you uh why do you like it what is it about it uh that's animating i don't know it's just it's fun to play that play this like intention game it's like you're trying to it's it's also a kind of way to have many games of scientific scientific hypothesis testing you're building a model of you know who has what each round but you're also building a model of the psychology of everyone on the table hmm. and all of these models fit together in this way that's really intuitive and people get really good at, you know, predicting what people have and and if they're lying, like that's and you're and you're doing predictions. You're putting your money on it. So it's a great way to test how rational you are. It's a very interesting. So you can within poker, you can't lie to yourself, but you have to lie to others. That you can lie to others potentially yeah, yeah. well you yeah. don't have to and you, you don't don't well, you want it? you probably don't probably not going to get very far if you <laughs> if you don't do it some part of the time yeah huh mm. and then also it, it collapses like there's an end state like yeah. a hypothesis and then it's uh, there's proof yeah so. there's a result of the test every round and then 
of the whole like three hour cash game that you're in who has the most by the end mm -hmm. tell if it was just lucky or if people made wise decisions it's very mm. interesting yeah who knows about the relationship between luck and wisdom i guess wisdom is knowing not to think luck isn't luck but also appreciating it when it is there i don't know yeah luck is definitely a part of it you know it's just you know you can increase uh your likelihood of of winning with with rationality with wise choices yeah huh. and okay so uh rationality is a semi-academic term for me because people we say that it's like critical theory we kind of know what it is we kind of don't know what it is with logic we can kind of use a soft form of logic but there's definitely a hard form of logic i think that there's softer and harder forms or intuitive and calculative forms of rationality is that fair to say like what what is what is it to be rational yeah, i guess there's two ways it's like having epistemic rationality having accurate models of the world, accurate maps of reality. In like the head. card counter kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that the um, the statistics of, you know, and the odds of getting certain hands and based on what's on the board. And also having, an, you know, a robust model of human psychology. That's also part of it, potentially. That's just part of epistemic rationality. And then instrumental rationality it's like getting having good strategies to get to your goals hmm. yeah you know, to meet that you know like effective altruism is all about instrumental rationality getting the most for the for the least input most output what's what's uh effective altruism again it, yeah it's this whole movement from the rationalist community and i think that's where it started it's like how do you most effectively uh, make the world a better place like with you know the money that you have the resources that you put into it how do you get the most out of it so yeah with street epistemology i'm mainly focusing on the epistemic rationality and helping people think through beliefs and claims and arguments it's, it's kind of a self-defense tool as well when you hear something from someone it helps you pr protect yourself from swindlers and you know con artists if you have you know good robust background knowledge of a lot of stuff you can pick up on this on what people are trying to do and you can you can tell if things don't quite make sense if if things are contradictory to other things in your background knowledge it helps you get a sense of when people are bullshitting you like you don't want to be bullshitted and yeah if you have a problem that needs to be solved you can apply rationality to help you solve it hmm. think through it truly really great do you have a uh i guess you're going to be working with uh peter uh come this spring what's that called again that project again the reverse q a tour oh okay so peter's not the one who's a m a ing he's the one who's a -ing. A -ing. Yeah. yeah okay yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. and yeah and i would like to i need a three-person camera crew oh I okay one, i have one person that i think is going to join me but i need one more and i would love to like invite you to join if you oh. are interested like that would that would be great i think do it, it do a really mini tour in the spring okay we'll, we'll you look. are definitely invited we'll, okay we'll look at the uh, calendar for that then off camera yeah yeah and do you have a uh like a magnum opus that teases you every once in a while do you have a sense that in the future in your 50s at some point you're going to do a thing is there is there something on the horizon that you think is ahead of you vague notions like i'd love to do another feature film on yeah. something you know fiction but that's a while off i'd love to get to do that again that, that's fun you yeah. know no idea what it would be though yeah do you ever see things in the culture cultural artifacts that are particularly uh, effective at doing what you would like to be done uh 
which would be dispelling the woke chokehold? Um, Can art do that without becoming just propaganda? It can, it can make a case for an answer to a broad question, hmm. like leaving it open for people to either accept the case or not, or it can just ask the question and, and present a scenario where the question is obviously the thing that's being asked hmm. and not give a definitive answer. It can be a vague type thing, or it can be propaganda and it's like, yes, this is the, the answer that you should believe. Hmm. Um, I think that's where it gets into propaganda, but real, you know, true, true film is not propaganda. It's um, something more than that. Hmm. You want it to be truth and be you know, like true and and beautiful, that type of thing, where it's not propaganda. It's like you can you can feel when it's when it goes too far but that's something i tried to think about have you uh, has there been a film this year that's blown your socks off or when's the last time a film really blew your socks off mm. i watched the get back documentary series um last week that was really great the beatles the beatles that was just amazing i don't know how they restored the audio on that and got the video <laughs> <laughs> like I'd love to see the before and after of how they did that. Um, but like fiction films, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to say. I'll have to look up my letterbox. I, I really liked uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It was probably the last one that I watched over and over again. For some reason, I just really liked that film. Yeah, that's great. Dune wasn't bad. I'll say that about Dune. The sound design was excellent. Yeah, Dune. I like Dune. Mm -hmm. Villa Venue is pretty cool. Yeah. The French Dispatch was okay. That's pretty funny. When was that? Uh, uh, a couple months ago. That's Wes oh. Anderson's latest movie. Oh, okay. Pig with Nicolas Cage. That was actually really good. Wait, P I G? P I G with Nicolas Cage. You know, no like, shit. That was actually. When was that? When did that come that out? That was a random independent movie <laughs> this summer. Oh, that, you know, I think I saw the poster online for it or something. Yeah, that was very interesting. Was it a. What, what, what's the rating? Like, it was super violent, super perverse, or. Not really, no. It was very low key and just a character piece. Hmm. It was like just a tragedy hmm. unfolding, and it was, I loved it. I'll check it out then. Hmm. I just don't want to be upset. Yeah. Oh, Bo Burnham's Inside. I love that. But that's more a comedy show. Oh, that's a show. The, yeah, the, the comedy special that Bo Burnham made inside his like external garage over the pandemic last yeah. year. Love that. Mm. Yeah, good stuff though. Well, Reed, uh, I'm going to end the recording now. Thank you for uh, joining me and doing a little bit of uh, kind of like a walkie-talkie epistemology kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the, the conversations. Those are, those are <laughs> he, you brought the calm, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.